Welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks for joining us. Last night, there was yet another senseless mass shooting. A gunman killed eight people, injured several others at a FedEx facility near the airport in Indianapolis. Then he killed himself. It was the third mass shooting this year in Indianapolis. Investigators were on the scene early today gathering information to figure out exactly what happened. Ephraim Graham has the story. Five people were hospitalized, one with critical injuries after the shooting. And FedEx said people who worked for the company were among the dead. Police were called about 11 o'clock last night. When they arrived on scene, they found the gunman was still shooting. As officers were responded, they, they arrived to an active shooter incident at that location. An eyewitness at the scene, Jeremiah Miller, told Wish Television at first he thought the shots were a car muffler or an engine, but then he heard six to ten shots. This made me stand up and actually look at the entrance door, and I saw a man with a submachine gun of some sort, an automatic rifle, and he was firing at, uh, in the open. And I immediately ducked down and got scared. The shooter wasn't immediately identified, and it wasn't known if he was an employee at the facility. One worker at the building said he heard gunshots while on break. Then we heard three more shots, and then my buddy Levi saw someone running out of the building, and then more shots went off. Somebody went behind their car to the trunk and got another and got another gun and then I saw one body on the floor. FedEx says it is cooperating with authorities as they investigate this tragic shooting. And family members gathered at a nearby hotel to wait for word on their loved ones. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Well, this is yet another horrific incident. Uh, you look at just that one city, Indianapolis, you have three uh, mass shootings in, in just a short space of time. Uh, will we ever find out the motive? I don't know. Uh, what, what would prompt someone to do this kind of thing? Here in Virginia Beach, we had a, a senseless mass shooting. We still don't know the motivation and, and what, was, what was the reason behind it. Um, let us, as Christians, realize that in the Bible, there's a, um, a really curious phrase. When that which restrains is taken away, and when you look at that, it, it sends a chill through your soul. What about our culture has been taken away so that people no longer have restraint, no longer want to observe the commandment, thou shalt not kill? And doing this on a regular basis, uh, where it's this suicide gunman, I'm going to kill as many people as I possibly can, then I'm going to turn the weapon on myself and I'm going to die in this blaze of carnage. What is not restraining in our culture today? And if, if that which restrains has been taken away, can we please pray to God, please return our restraints? Turning now to the news from Washington, where the Democrats are going to be packing the Supreme Court. The Ca Democrats on Capitol Hill are want to add four more justices to the bench, and that move is getting pushed back from both parties. Jennifer Wishon explains. The Constitution leaves the number of justices on the Supreme Court up to Congress, and some Democrats say it's time to add more. Standing in front of the Supreme Court Thursday, congressional Democrats introduced the Judiciary Act of 2021. They say the court's standing is damaged because President Trump and Senate Republicans added three new justices. And the way we repair it is straightforward. We undo the damage that the Republicans have done by restoring balance. And we do it by adding four seats to the court to create a 13-member Supreme Court. Four new seats to be filled by President Biden. Some people will say we're packing the court. We're not packing it. We're unpacking it. Senator McConnell and the Republicans packed the court over the last couple of years. Liberal activists had pushed for the idea, but not all Democrats are on board. I think if you uh, try to expand it uh, right now, that's going to 
further polarize and tear apart this country. Packing the court was a big issue during the election, and last week President Biden set up a commission to look at possible court reforms. One of the issues they'll look at is, of course, the size of the court, uh, but they'll also look at the court's role in the constitutional system, the length of service, the turnover of justices. For now, Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's not bringing the bill to the House floor. I don't know that that's a good idea or a bad idea. I think it's a, an idea that should be considered, and I think the president's taking the right approach uh, to um, to have a commission to study such a thing. It's a big step. She clearly doesn't have the vote. She's a good vote counter. She does not have the votes uh, on the House floor. Uh, she doesn't have those moderate Democrats to go along. But if you have the commission that she supports and you go with that first and then you get the commission results, then the bill, I think that's the trick for Democrats of how they're going to try to do this. Republicans say it's another example of Democrats wanting to change the rules when they don't get their way. Now, if Republicans had introduced a bill to add four Supreme Court seats for the last president to fill, there would have been weeks of wall-to-wall -wall outrage on every newspaper and cable TV channel. The president famously didn't take a position on the issue during the campaign, but he did say this. I've already spoken on, I, I'm not a fan of pack, uh, court packing. And the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a liberal icon, was also against it, telling NPR in 2019, nine seems to be a good number. Well, if anything would make the court appear partisan, it would be that. One side saying, when we're in power, we're going to enlarge the number of judges, so we will have more people who will vote the way we want them to. In a speech last week, Justice Stephen Breyer, appointed by President Clinton, spoke against court packing, saying, think long and hard before embodying those changes in law. It's not popular among Americans. A New York Times poll conducted last fall found 58% oppose packing the court. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. There's a social contract in America, and I think we're losing sight of that social contract on both sides. Uh, that when parties get into power, they suddenly now want to drive through these uh, agendas uh, in order to appeal to extreme wings on, on both sides. But in that, you're going to lose the middle. And when you lose the social contract, you've lost a great deal. Uh, we've already seen what happens when you start to bring into question the integrity of the election process. But when you bring into a question the integrity of the Supreme Court, uh, right now there's no governance over the Supreme Court. You, once they rule, it's the established law of the land. But if you pack that court, if you change the social con contract, what happens when the population says, well, this is all partisan politics, we're not going to follow what the Supreme Court does? Are you bringing into question the very basic of our, our social contract, which is the rule of law? When you start saying laws aren't being properly made and judicial decisions aren't being properly made, you're breaking the social contract. That is horrific in our current culture. We are so polarized, we can't come together at all. You can't even have a cup of coffee with somebody on the other side, let alone try to come to a bipartisan agreement about a bill. What, imagine what would happen if the Supreme Court becomes this partisan body pushing a progressive agenda. It will tear the nation apart. Please do not do this. Well, in the news, we've got another partisan effort. Democrats are pushing to make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. That would drive a partisan Senate. Um, what, what's going on is they want to ensure a Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate. Because if D.C. gets a, a statehood, they get two extra senators, and you're pretty much sure that there's going to be Democrats. So let's go to Ephraim Graham for that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the House Oversight Committee passed the bill which would make D.C. a state. It be called Washington Douglas Commonwealth. The measure passed on a party line vote with Democrats supporting it, but no Republicans. Democrats argue D.C. should be a state because its residents pay federal taxes without representation in the federal government. The full House is set to vote on the bill next week. 
but it faces major problems in the Senate, where it died last year after the House passed it. Not all Senate Democrats support it, and Republicans argue the Democrats just want the additional two senators who will likely vote with them. The Biden administration is imposing sweeping sanctions on Russia and expelling 10 Russian diplomats. The moves are meant to punish Russia for interfering in U.S. elections and hacking into federal agencies. The president saying the U.S. does not want to kick off, a, kick off a cycle of escalation and conflict with Russia, but he would take more action if necessary. Russia promised retaliation. The president did say he hopes Vladimir Putin will meet with him for a summit in Europe this summer. A showdown in Congress Thursday between Dr. Anthony Fauci and Ohio Republican Congressman Jim Jordan over what it will take to reopen more of the country from the COVID-19 lockdowns. No. When do we get to the point, what measure, what standard, what objective uh, outcome do we have to reach before, before Americans get their liberty and freedoms back? You know, I, you're indicating liberty and freedom. I look at it as a public health measure to prevent people from dying and going to the hospital. You don't think Americans' liberties have been threatened the last year, Dr. Fauci? They've been assaulted. Their liberties have. I don't look at this as a liberty thing, Congressman Jordan. Well, that's obvious. As a public health thing. Fauci went on to say he believes the U.S. is at a crossroads in fighting the pandemic with vaccines rolling out, but cases still going up in some states. Turning now to Israel, which will reopen its skies to small groups of vaccinated tourists starting next month after a year of being closed. That's because Israel is moving to revive its economy now that more than half of the population has received both doses of the COVID vaccine. As Chris Mitchell reports, a major part of the recovery includes a controversial green pass. The so-called passport is being offered only to those fully vaccinated or who have recovered from COVID-19. Either get the vaccine or avoid certain kinds of risky interactions with others. Only the passport holders will be allowed to eat inside restaurants, go to the gym and swimming pool, enter houses of worship, attend other various events, and fly into the country without quarantining. If someone decides not to get the vaccine, uh, they are within their right to do so. But it's also true that they should be the ones who bear the cost of this poor decision. Those without a green pass can also have a negative PCR test a maximum of 72 hours before an event. Tourists must have a negative PCR test before boarding the plane to Israel. And when they land as well, have a serology test at Ben Gurion Airport to prove they've been vaccinated. Israel is working with other countries to find a method for recognizing each other's vaccines. Some feel the Green Pass program is government overreach and possibly illegal. The WHO and most of the governments in, in, in the world so far, certainly the United States, has not adopted this measure. Even if you want to vaccinate, one has to be careful in not uh, forcing vaccination. Renowned immunologist Dr. Zvi Bentwich of Ben-Gurion University is part of the Emergency Public Council for the Coronavirus Crisis. The group, comprised of doctors, scientists and others, have filed a lawsuit with the Supreme Court, calling the Green Pass coercive and predatory. We are not against vaccination, but we are against the usage of a measure that would cause discrimination and enforcement of measures that would impinge on basically on human rights. Professor David Enoch at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem disagrees. When done properly, it does not violate a human or civil rights. Giving at least a fairly successful vaccination effort, green passport policy is the way to do that. Having a policy, let's say in restaurants, that everybody will wear a mask and there would be some sort of distancing. But by saying that you cannot enter a place unless you have this passport, that's a different story. Many Israelis hope that once herd immunity is achieved, green passes and other restrictions will be unnecessary, so life can just return to normal. Meanwhile, these passports will rule the day. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Debates on these passports likely to unfold in other countries as well. Gordon?
And I think the debate's going to come right here to the United States. And, and you look at past histories of pandemics, um, you see governments really trying to enforce quarantines. Uh, uh, my, my mother had scarlet fever as a child, and uh, her entire household was quarantined. Uh, and that was enforced. And it meant that they couldn't leave the house, uh, period. Uh, they had to close all the windows. Uh, they, they were in an enforced quarantine. So has it happened here in America? The answer is yeah. Will it happen again? I'm not so sure. And when you get into uh, what does this really mean for the average citizen, and certainly what does it mean to the poor in our culture? Do they have access to medical care? Do they have access to vaccinations? And then you get into the whole issue of enforced vaccination. Uh, and will this be a, a de facto thing where if you in good conscience say, I don't want to take this, I, I think it's too experimental. Uh, I'm, I, I want to have children. I'm worried about what mRNA can do. I, 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 we don't know these things. So it, it's going to open a whole bunch of questions and our civil liberties are going to be a part of that debate. But will it actually actually come? Not so sure here in America, but it's definitely going to come to international travel. And I see the countries all around the world saying you don't get to land in our airport if you don't have a, a vaccine card, if you're not protected from this. We don't want to import the pandemic yet again. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Well, it's an ongoing debate in our administration as to whether to call our southern border a crisis zone. Uh, but here are the facts. It's worse than you may think. Every day, 6,000 illegal immigrants are flooding the U.S. border, and it's creating a hotbed of drug smuggling and human trafficking. Women and little girls are most at risk with up to 80 percent chance of being raped. Tara Mergener has just returned from the Rio Grande, where she spoke to some of the migrants firsthand. We're in the Rio Grande Valley looking across the river at Mexico. This is the busiest place for illegal immigration in the United States. It's our first visit since the change in administration. And the first time we've been told Border Patrol is not allowed to assist us. But thanks to the help of local law enforcement officials and private citizens, a glimpse at what many believe is a crisis growing out of control. on U.S. soil for the first time. A group of mostly Central American migrant mothers and children smiling on the home stretch. <laughs> like the 6,000 others per day reported to be going around official entries at Texas's southernmost point, they believe the journey is a success. What, what made you come to the United States now? It, was there something you heard in your own country? that made you decide this was a good time to come? He, he, read, he saw in the news there was a new president and uh, he had more opportunity. Smugglers see more opportunity too as they navigate dangerous rip currents racing across the Rio Grande one after the other, hour after hour. Mexican authorities watch it happen from the water as U.S. border agents manage dozens, even hundreds at a time, while also trying to keep cameras away. Okay, can you please not interfere in our enforcement? Because this is private property. The government does not own this property, but they're telling us we have to leave right now. They're During the commotion on shore, scouts give the all clear for another crossing. The distance only about the length of a football field. This is the Mexican side of the border. In the sand, the footprints of thousands of migrants who've waited to cross into the U.S. with the help of a smuggler. It happens all day, every day. Fearing for her own safety, this resident asked we hide her identity. In the last couple months, how many rafts have you seen cross in the time you've been out here? If I had to give you an estimate, I would say at least 60, 70 per day, it's hundreds of people. Most come from Central America, traveling weeks to get here. 
Nearly all claim to be fleeing violence and poverty. What will you do now that you're in the United States? Pues aprovechar la oportunidad que se nos ha brindado ante todo, ¿verdad? Along the way, many become victims of abuse and exploitation. Often at the hands of drug cartel members, they pay thousands of dollars to get them here. Especially we have women and little girls coming in in thousands. And we all know that women and little girls have a 60 to 80 percent chance of getting raped. Not all who make the trip survive. Sometimes see dead bodies floating and stuff because they try to make it across where they get snagged on the bottom or, or whatever reason they, they don't make it. Still, many do, including the unaccompanied children crammed into this overflowing detention facility in Donna, Texas. Every facility we have along the southwest border is over capacity right now. Uh, just yesterday, we had over 10,000 people in Border Patrol custody. That's much higher, especially under COVID uh, constraints than... Uh, any facility should, should have. We saw makeshift facilities like this one under a bridge intended to go undetected by media and other observers. Migrants are then sent to area shelters and in a matter of hours, free to go. They're released so they can continue that, their legal proceedings here in the United States somewhere where they're going. Only recently is the Border Patrol confirming the record numbers being released into the U.S. without court dates as the system grows more overwhelmed by the day. In March alone, an estimated 171,000 plus entered the U.S. illegally, five times more than a year ago. By year's end, the number expected to reach more than one million. As soon as uh, they get up to this side, they go ahead and uh, flag down Border Patrol because they want to get caught, because they know they're going to get processed and, and then uh, shipped out to wherever they're going to get shipped out. They're not going to get deported back to their, their country. Signs of the migrant surge, like these pants left behind, are obvious on the border. But experts say the problem is increasingly being felt across the nation in areas far from the Rio Grande Valley. In South Texas, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, thanks for that great report, Tara. Let, let's do some math here. Uh, if you're having 171,000 in one month, uh, you multiply that by 12, you're up to 2 million. Uh, just imagine what that does to our over, already overwhelmed social services. What does that do to the already overwhelmed immigration authority? You're not going to see this report on other news because it challenges the administration's stance on border control, uh, on the border wall. Uh, and so they want to give the administration a pass, and they're letting the administration get away with, well, this isn't a crisis. The fa facts on the ground, this is a crisis. And you heard directly from one of the mi migrants, we heard on the news that there was a new president. That's what's fueling this. That's how you go from 34,000 to 171,000. And if the administration doesn't wake up to the crisis, well, it's going to continue. As a nation, we can't have that kind of flood of migration uh, without it severely impacting our cities and our social services. Uh, so we have to do something about it. If a nation can't enforce its own borders, is it really a nation? If you can't enforce your own immigration laws, again, are you a nation? You have to stand up for the rule of law. If Congress wants to pass a bill saying, well, let's just open up everything and take all comers, okay. But this is not the law. And to have an overwhelmed immigration service say, because we can't process them, we're just going to release them into the society. Well, that's not a solution, uh, and that shouldn't happen under any administration. So please enforce the laws that are on the books. The blood, the bullets, the horror. Alexander relived the conflict that had crippled his homeland every single day. PTSD changed him to a, chained him to a cycle of destruction. So how did he finally stop the madness? 
Take a look. You know, after every day, you're listening to the grenades and bullets and everything else. It's all terrible thing that happened in, the, in uh, Yugoslavia at that time. Just the brothers and sisters separating, you know, killings everywhere, you know, it's just terrible. Aleksandr Opanjic is from Yugoslavia and witnessed firsthand the terror of the Bosnian War. In 1997, he moved to the United States, but was unable to escape the horrors of what he had experienced. After the war, you know, I, I had a pretty pretty bad PTSD, you know. I've been, I've been shot over there. I've been, um, I have shrapnels in legs. You wake up in the night, you know, in a cold sweat, and uh, all these memories are going. You just, uh, you try not to think of, you know, you try to deal with everything, uh, trying to heal myself with uh, everything else, you know. It's like, it's all good, it's gone, and it's, and I try to tell myself things, you know, it, it, it happened because you, you gotta forget this because it's gonna affect me in the future. Alexander turned to drugs and alcohol to cope with the trauma. I was doing the methamphetamines at that time and uh, smoked a lot of weed and drink a bunch of alcohol, you know, so I could cope with uh, whatever I was going through. Forgive, forget about, you know, all the memories and everything. I was just, yeah, I was drunk, you know, I would work midnight to eight and uh, after that I would go to the bar until two, three o'clock afternoon and then pass out at the house and go back to work and that was my days, you know. He eventually got married and had a son, but his escalating drug addiction destroyed his young family. Drugs, you know, and alcohol, that, that's, that's all I could see at that time. There was no attention to her and uh, I was, then I started going out, like I would stay out for like a couple of days and, and then, you know, I understand everything that happened, you know, what, what drove her to just take my son and, and uh, you know, just go. Alexander's wife took everything and left him. He became friends with the group of bikers who led him into a life of crime, selling drugs and guns. We would hang out and uh, they were friends, you know. They, that time they would just, to help me out, they would give me, here go buddy, you know, take some of this, take some of that and uh, you'll make this month, you know. Many arrests followed, but in the summer of 2006, while locked up in jail, he heard a minister talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're like, Jesus is the son of God, you know. He's a, the father, father, son, you know. And then I listened and listened, and all of a sudden it just like, I received, you know. I, and it was just like a lightning to me. And I was like, wow. And he loves me. And then I felt his spirit on me. And, and I was, I was just overwhelmed with the, with the love. When he was released from jail, he went back to his old ways. Before long, he was arrested again on weapons charges and became overwhelmed with hopelessness. And I was just like, what my life is, you know, I thought like, why am I doing drugs, stealing, you know, taxing people for money and, uh, and I'm just, I, I decided to hang myself that day. And I was like, uh, it's time for me to go. You know, I, I lived kind of a rough life, you know. So I decided, and then I hear this voice. It says, open a Bible. <laughs> and I was like, open a Bible. I said, okay. And I opened a Bible. I mean, I just opened a Bible, like, <laughs> and I read. In his cell that night, God revealed the many ways he had protected him and saved his life through the years. Alexander then fully surrendered his life to Jesus. His gun charge was dropped unexpectedly, and he was released from jail, this time to a new life in Christ. There is freedom in the Jesus. There is a love in the Jesus. There is acceptance in the Jesus. There is a friend in the Jesus. Anything that your, your heart is missing and needs is in the Jesus, you know. If you decide to believe him, I decided to believe him all the way on every word that he told me. I knew the life without it, and right now I know a life with him. It's fulfillment of every, every need that I have. Right now, I just want to live the life for the Lord. God has given Alexander a new start in life. He was also set free from the PTSD that had kept him chained to a cycle of destruction. Well, I'm so thankful for the God right now in my life right now. He gave me a beautiful wife. Uh, he gave me a mission to do in my life, 
to glorify his name through to whatever I do, that he be in the first place. And uh, it's amazing freedom that I feel and, uh, clean, and cleanness inside me. He cleansed me from all my sins. I feel clean like I, I'm just a newborn man. There's only one place you get that kind of start over, and it's with Jesus Christ. You know, Alexander didn't really know much about Jesus and the beginning of his story when he talks about all of the things he had been through in Yugoslavia, the war, the horror, uh, the things that altered his mind and his, his, uh, just his spirit, you know, that discouragement that came on him. Where did he find it? Well, it started when he was in jail. You know, sometimes God allows things to happen to us that bring difficulty to us, that even restrain us in some capacity so we can hear about him, so we can stop doing our thing, which is dulling us because we're just trying to deal with the pain and the disappointment and the hopelessness, so we can hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And then Alexander said a very interesting thing. He said, then I decided to follow Jesus. You know, it really is just that, isn't it? You can know a lot about Jesus up here. If you live in America, you probably do because it's been a part of our culture. And so you might know about him. You might even have gone to church when you were a kid. Maybe you're going to church right now, but you don't know him. You know, Alexander was set free because he decided to believe, and believing means trusting. This is what God's word says to those who will trust him. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me because he trusts me. Yeah, the peace that Alexander found, Jesus Christ brought into his heart and life. You can have that too. You know, some of you are at your rope's end. Don't do anything foolish. Give Jesus Christ the same chance you've given every other person and thing in your life that has never brought you what you're looking for. You're meant to find that in your creator. And it is as simple as a prayer away. That's what Alexander found. And it is true for me. It is true for you. You get on your knees before the living God and you say, God, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Thank you for waiting for me. Today, I am choosing, I decide to trust you. I'm giving you my life, all that I am, all that I have, and I'm asking you to change me. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm also asking you to change the way I think, change the, my perspective on things. I want to know your ways. I want to live your way. I want to follow you. No more on my own. I want to follow you, Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and thank you for a new beginning. Thank you for a start over in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Listen, if you've just prayed that prayer, if that's the desire of your heart, you've begun a new way of living. What do you do now? We've got a free packet for you. It's been put together just for you and it's filled with information. How do you follow Jesus? What does that mean? This is free, so is the call to get it. It's on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I'd like the new day packet. We will get this out to you right away. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Former Vice President Mike Pence has undergone surgery to have a pacemaker implanted. His office says Wednesday's procedure went well and he's expected to recover fully and return to normal activity in the coming days. The 61-year-old Pence had experienced symptoms associated with a slow heart over the past two weeks. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping to provide food for those in need. Angela is a single mother with two sons, ages four and six. She started her own in-home daycare business a few years ago, which did well at first, but enrollment dropped off and her bills began to pile up. She was starting to lose hope when she was introduced to Warehouse of Hope, an Operation Blessing partner in her area. Warehouse of Hope is stocked with food and other supplies for struggling families, and she was able to get great food there. Now, Angela has a stable job and is eternally grateful to Operation Blessing's partners for helping her to get back on her feet. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org.
Well, no matter how she juggled the bills, Jeannie always came up short. Then she decided to become a real estate agent. Well, that's when she heard a message on TV that helped her make her first sale. Even better, it helped her quadruple her income. Jeannie Lazic is a widow who struggled to provide for her family for years, even when her late husband, Alan, was still alive. Her financial challenges started early in her marriage when the couple planned to adopt one child and took home three siblings instead. So my husband walks in the room and all the kids made a beeline to him, threw themselves on him and said, Dad. The Lazics bought a bigger home to accommodate their new family. The cost of raising three children was more than they'd expected. There was definitely a financial pressure going on because um, work was intermittent. So our wages would always go up and down, up and down. And some months we didn't make it. Alan was a part-time salesperson and homeschooled the kids, while Jeannie worked as a court reporter and was responsible for most of the family's bills. The mortgage and the needs of the kids, it was just way too much. I, I couldn't keep up with the amount of work that was needed. The Lazics ultimately lost their home and filed for bankruptcy. Alan and I, we just, you feel like a failure, you know? Like, you feel like you're a loser. Meanwhile, Alan developed serious health problems and was eventually diagnosed with terminal liver cancer. Alan ended up dying in my arms. The way I got through this difficult time was um, going in the prayer closet, crying a lot. But I know that God has a special place for widows and orphans. Needing extra money during this time, Jeannie became a real estate agent on the side. She also watched stories on the 700 Club about people who shared how giving 10% of their income actually helped them overcome their financial trouble and plan for the future. Jeannie vowed that when she sold her first house, she'd give 10% to God. It's the only area in the Bible where God says, test me in this. I didn't know where it was going to come from. I didn't know what it was going, but I just held on to the promises of the Bible. Soon, Jeannie made that first sale. God is so good. It was a sale that literally just fell out of the sky. My reaction was, oh my gosh, we made it. This is really going to work. Tithed off the first sale, and it was the best and easiest thing I've ever done. After that, her sales increased, and she gave 10% of every house she sold. One place she started giving to was CBN. I feel like the 700 Club knows no bounds. They're there to help. All the monies go. They're faithful stewards of it. Um, they help internationally. They help with basic needs. Today, Jeannie's sales are four times what they used to be. So now she has a savings account. Recently, she bought a house for herself and one son who still lives at home. And soon she's gonna start investing in residential properties that will generate even more income for retirement. Has been the best years ever. No self-promotion and then I get sales out of people that I don't even know out of the blue. It's amazing, and especially the short amount of time and all I can tie it into is the tithe. That has been the only difference. And I just am so grateful to God for what he has done for myself and my family. It's only the hand of God. Let Jeannie's story encourage you. God watches over his word to perform it. And he performed it for her when she said, okay, I'm going to start tithing. Not as a one-time thing, not as an on-again, off-again thing, but as a lifestyle to say, I'm going to put God first. You see the increase, and it fulfills the words of Jesus. Give, and it will be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. The measure you use, it will be measured back to you. She put that into practice. It seems counterintuitive. We always want to say, well, I'll give when I have enough or I'll give from my excess. No, give and then it will be given unto you. If you want to start that, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to start giving to the 700 Club. How much is that? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can give at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold for you at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. 
Make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, and you know you're putting God first. Every single month, your gift will be processed by the bank. There's no checks to write. There's nothing extra to do. We can send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or just text CBN to 71777, or go to CBN.com. There's a place on the giving page where you can give monthly. Either way, do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. She could feel the pull and she could hear the tear. Tammy Miller knew instantly that she had seriously hurt her shoulder playing tennis. Ice didn't help, heat didn't help, and neither did her doctor. So what stopped the pain? Take a look. Tammy Miller is a grandmother and grade school teacher who loves staying active and playing sports. One afternoon while playing tennis with her husband, Tammy injured her shoulder. So I was in full stride, almost running to get to the ball, and then I overextended my arm. It felt like a pull, like a tweak or a pull in my shoulder. I felt it, I could hear it. For three months, Tammy tried everything to alleviate the pain. I iced it, and then I would put a heating pad on it. I did a pain reliever. So that rotator cuff, it wasn't allowing me to come back. I mean, it hurt to go to sleep. I didn't sleep well. One morning in December, while off from work, she started watching TV and came across the 700 Club. Gordon and Terry started praying. And when I turned it on, I said, I wonder if he'll pray for my shoulder. And then it became, I think he's going to pray for my shoulder. I felt very confident that he was going to pray for my shoulder. Gordon said, uh, So when you got severe problems in your right shoulder, it's a deep injury, and it's like your shoulder has locked up, and God's healing it. He's restoring it. Just begin to do what you couldn't do before and realize God has healed you. He set you free. I said yes. I said, I, I, that's for me. At that point, I really did feel relief. I went up, I went back, it didn't hurt. I did all those things I couldn't do. It was instant. I had, I had, I felt it and I was so excited. But then a few days later, the pain began to creep back in. I believe totally in, in healing. I just didn't understand why it was returning and I thought, um, maybe it was my lack of faith or something to that effect. I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to pray through this thing and just keep trusting God and keep professing it and just go back to the scriptures about healing and just keep reading them. But the pain persisted, and after a few weeks, Tammy decided to go see a doctor. He x-rayed my shoulder and said it was um, a calcification due to an injury. He saw there a little teeny tear on the rotator cuff. The doctor sent Tammy to physical therapy, but that only made it worse. I was frustrated because, you know, I'm active. I want to I wanna move, and I don't want to move with lots of pain. And I want to do things. One night in February at the dinner table, Tammy told her family she was going to keep trusting God. I just said, you know what? I have been healed. I was healed December 29th, and I am healed. So I just know I am, and I'm going to just walk it out. I'm just going to, I'm going to live it out. It was a turning point. From there, I just know that I just started doing what I normally do. I started trying to reach back. I started this. I would wash back here. I would do all kinds of things with my hand, and it just, it just got better and better and better. And I didn't do any more PT. Ever since, Tammy's shoulder has been pain-free. The whole experience strengthened her faith. God heals, and He loves us. And He doesn't always heal us in the same way, but He loves us. And he's listening when we're praying. He is listening. He is listening. He knows everything about you. He numbers every hair on your head. What is he looking for? Well, he's looking for what Tammy demonstrated. He's looking for faith. Faith is a verb. Uh, we, we often think of it as just a noun, but no, it's a verb. When you act your faith, uh, one of the great miracles in the New Testament a man paralyzed is let down by his friends to be before Jesus. And the Gospels record this wonderful phrase, when he saw their faith. Faith is visible to God. 
He understands that when you believe. Now, for Tammy, it was a process. Here she hears, hears a words of knowledge, and she goes, yeah, that's for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that. And she has an instant reaction to it. Her, her body responds instantly. Why? Because God's healing power is always on. It's not an on-again, off-again thing. He's always there. His healing is always available. The cross is always available to you. The, by his stripes, we were healed. It's always there. It's always on. It's not something he turns on and off. What happens is faith accesses that and accesses that power. So she has an instant reaction. Then over time, little twinge, little pain, worry set, sets in, doubt, unbelief come back. All of these things happen. And suddenly, oh, no, I, I've lost my healing. But Tammy said, no, I haven't lost anything. I haven't lost God. I haven't lost Jesus. I haven't lost his power. I'm going to act my faith. And in that, she gets complete healing for a rotator cuff tear. Now, doctors will tell you that's impossible to heal without some kind of surgery. But here it's healed for her. Now, what medical condition are you facing? And do you believe that God's power is right there for you? It's not on again, off again. It's always on. What you need is to believe and to rely and to trust and to act your faith. So let's pray. You, in an act of faith, this is one God can see. You can see it too. Lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Terry and I will pray with you. The Bible says, when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus Christ. You can rely on them. So let's pray. Let's not have any doubt. Let's believe and let God do all the rest. Lord, we come to you. We come to you in faith, believing, relying on your cross relying on your stripes, relying on your resurrection power. In Jesus' name, I command my body now to be healed and to be made whole. By the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. There's someone with a back condition, a strong curvature of the spine, God is straightening that for you right now. Terry, what do you think? Someone's had a bad fall. You have a very serious contusion that's not been healing well, but God's healing that right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a good report. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Peter. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other.